Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. I have a very special narration to share with you today. I was recently contacted by an author by the name of Charles Oldham. Charles is an attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina, and also the author of a book called The Senator's Son. This book is published by Beach Glass Books in Richmond, Virginia. It's about an eight-year-old boy named Kenneth Beasley, who disappeared many years ago, very mysteriously, and still has never been found. Charles has provided us with a summary of this fascinating case to narrate today, and I have provided the relevant links below for anyone who would like to purchase his book. I would highly recommend it. So here is the story of the Senator's son in the words of Charles Oldham. This story goes back more than a century to 1905, and it happened in Currituck County, not far from the Outer Banks on the North Carolina coast. Today, that area has a busy highway running through it, full of tourists heading to the beach. There are surf shops and waterfront marinas all over the place. But back in 1905, it was still the horse and buggy days, and Kenneth, the boy who went missing, lived on a farm in an isolated community near the waterfront. Everyone around lived by farming, fishing and hunting ducks and geese. It takes some effort to imagine what the area looked like back then, but if you venture off the highway onto one of the side roads, as few of the beachgoers do, it does not take long to find that Carolina tidewater as it once was. You can still see old white farmhouses surrounded by fields, with the fields surrounded by woods. The Beasley family lived in one of them. There are wide front yards, most of them with a big oak tree or two, and many of them with a small family cemetery nearby. In the old days, farm families held onto the land and to each other. Few people cared to venture too far afield, even after death. One of those side roads leads a couple of miles to the tiny crossroads of Poplar Branch. This was where Kenneth lived with his parents and his older brother and sister. Once you're off the highway, back in the woods, the sounds of the traffic die away quickly. The road dips into the bottom land of the Maple Swamp, where dark water licks up against the trunks of sweet gum, maple and cypress trees, so thick that it is always a challenge to see even 10 feet in front of you. All around are shadows, not just in the summer when the leaves grow thickly on the trees and the sunlight barely filters down to dapple the ground. Even on an overcast winter day, the light creates illusions. The grey tree bark casts its reflection onto the water and you have to watch your step carefully. What you see might actually be a fallen limb and it might be solid enough to support you, or it might not. It might also be one of the poisonous snakes which abound in the area. If you wanted to get lost in the woods, this would be an easy place to do it, especially if you were an eight-year-old boy like Kenneth, or just as well if you wanted a boy to get lost in the woods and leave no trace, this spot could serve your purpose. It all began on Monday morning, February the 13th, 1905. Young Kenneth set out to walk the half mile from his parents' farm to the two-room country schoolhouse that he attended with the other local children. It was a cold and windy day with some snow still on the ground after a recent winter storm. He was dressed warmly in a grey suit with heavy coat, brown stockings, gloves and a blue cap. By all accounts, Kenneth was a bright, happy, well-liked third grader. His teacher commented later to the newspapers about how much he enjoyed school and how well behaved he was. From family photos and from the missing child notices that were printed later, we know that he had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was a very cute kid and in a later era, his face would have been featured on many milk cartons and nightly news bulletins. He was also the child of an important local politician. Kenneth's father, Samuel Beasley, was the state senator 
who represented Currituck County in the North Carolina General Assembly. When Kenneth reached the schoolhouse, he was greeted by his teacher, Miss Nina Harrison. Miss Nina was a new teacher in her 20s and came from an even more prominent local family than Kenneth. Her father, Joshua Harrison, was a prosperous local farmer and landowner whose brother-in-law was Thomas Jarvis, a former governor of North Carolina and a United States senator. Once the class had gathered, Miss Nina led Kenneth and her other students through the morning lessons. By the time noonday recess arrived, the sun had come out and warmed the air quite a bit. Kenneth took off his heavy coat, left it in the closet and headed out into the back schoolyard to play with the other boys. The schoolyard bordered onto the dark, shadowy depths of the maple swamp. When the school bell rang to summon the kids back to class, Kenneth turned to his cousin, Benny Walker, and he said, I'm going back farther. Without another word, Kenneth stepped off into the woods, never to be seen again. When Kenneth didn't return to class, and the teachers realised he was lost in the swamp, they put out a call to all the men in the community to start searching. There was no time to lose, because the weather had turned cloudy and cold again. Rain started to fall, which then turned to snow. They knew that Kenneth was without his coat, and he would die from hypothermia if they didn't find him. Several dozen men gathered, and they formed a dragnet to comb through the flooded woods. They searched on hands and knees, through piles of brush, and then poked with sticks into the dark, stagnant creeks, fearful that Kenneth might have slipped into the water and drowned. After several days, the searchers looked to the sky for buzzards, thinking that if Kenneth had died in the woods, the birds would lead them to the body, but none were seen. Newspapers throughout North Carolina and Virginia began to cover the story of the missing child, and as you'd expect, their descriptions were heartrending. Senator Beasley had to return home where the legislature was in session to comfort his distraught wife. Kenneth's mother was near collapse, taking sedatives and now and then crying out, give me the body of my boy. The searchers were surprised not to find the boy either dead or alive. And when they didn't, it caused them to wonder whether Kenneth really had, just by chance, gotten lost in the woods behind his schoolhouse. Had he been kidnapped? The rumour mill started to churn and they focused immediately on one man in particular, Miss Nina's father, Joshua Harrison. It turned out that Joshua, even though he had married well and owned a lot of land, had a checkered past. Many described him as violent-tempered, a man who intimidated his neighbours. Now in his late sixties, with five grown children, Joshua had been charged with murder twice in his younger years. Thirty-some years earlier, he had been accused of killing his own father and also of shooting a young boy who was about the same age as Kenneth. But in both cases, juries had found him not guilty. Some suspected that his prominent brother-in-law helped him get off. Joshua was also well known in the community as a bootlegger who produced illegal wine on his farm. Some of the locals liked drinking his product, but most of them, in that evangelical era, disapproved of drinking, or at least claimed to disapprove. Senator Beasley recently had pushed legislation through the General Assembly to prohibit selling wine in Currituck County, and Joshua was reportedly angry about it. It might have given him a motive to take revenge on the senator by stealing his child. Plus, North Carolina politics in those days was just a nasty, brutal business all around. Reconstruction was over and white supremacists had recently taken control of the state government through a violent campaign of voter intimidation towards black people. Lynchings were almost a daily occurrence throughout the South in the early 1900s, and in 1898, the year that Senator Beasley was first elected to office, 
dozens of black people have been killed in a race riot in Wilmington, North Carolina. Life, even the life of an innocent child, was cheap when political power was at stake. So the newspapers started printing vague rumours from locals, and not all of them would speak for attribution. Some of the locals claimed to have seen a man who looked like Joshua on the day Kenneth disappeared. He was riding away from Poplar Branch in his mule-drawn buggy, accompanied by a young boy who looked like Kenneth, wearing brown stockings and a blue cap. It's not clear whether Senator Beasley took seriously the rumours that Joshua had snatched his son. Publicly, he told the papers that he believed someone had kidnapped Kenneth for money, but he did not know who, and he was waiting to receive a ransom demand. Yet, ransom kidnapping was almost unheard of in those days. By 1905, well before the gangster era of the 1930s, when kidnapping became a national epidemic, there had been only two confirmed cases of it anywhere in the United States. The first, the kidnapping of four-year-old Charlie Ross in Philadelphia in 1874, became a national sensation and a heartbreak, as the boy was never found despite his parents' anguished searching. Then in 1900, Eddie Cudahy, the teenage son of a wealthy Omaha businessman, was kidnapped, but then released safely after his father paid the demanded ransom. That story might have encouraged a would-be kidnapper who thought he could quietly steal a child and collect a quick payoff. This is where the mystery gets very dark and shadowy. We don't know whether Joshua or anyone else approached Senator Beasley and tried to negotiate a ransom. No one was legally charged with the kidnapping until September 1906, which was 18 months after Kenneth disappeared. Senator Beasley contacted local prosecutors and swore out a warrant against Joshua Harrison for the crime. Joshua was locked up in the jail amid new rumours that he might be lynched before his trial. Why the long wait? As the senator told the story, it was not until then that Joshua contacted him through an intermediary and complained about how he had not yet offered up enough ransom for his son. Further. Joshua said it was really expensive to hold the boy captive for so long. In March 1907, Joshua went to trial in the Old Brick Courthouse in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. The trial lasted a week and was by far the biggest spectacle in town. All newspapers agreed that the courthouse was jam-packed every day. Five prosecutors handled the case for the state and Joshua hired four defence attorneys of exceptional talent. Two of them were former governors of the state, his brother-in-law, Thomas Jarvis, and Charles B. Aycock, who had left office just two years earlier. At the trial, Senator Beasley testified that Joshua had argued violently with him about the wine legislation shortly before Kenneth disappeared, and Joshua threatened to make him sorry. Several of the Beasley's neighbours told the jury of how they saw the mysterious man, whom they now believed was Joshua, driving with the young boy in his buggy. Naturally, when the defence cross-examined them, they were asked why they had waited a year and a half to tell their stories. It was just none of their business, one of them said. Joshua's wife, sons, and several other family members testified that he had been at home, working in his fields the entire day when Kenneth went missing, so he couldn't have done it, they said. But those witnesses were obviously his relatives. Their bias was clear. Looking at this today, we would naturally have some doubts about how all of these various stories came together. By today's legal standards, they really should have found Joshua not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But nevertheless, the jury was convinced by the Beasley stories and likely also their heartfelt grief at losing their child. The jurors deliberated for about eight hours before finding Joshua guilty. He was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, but tearfully continued to proclaim his innocence. 
Joshua appealed his conviction and the judge allowed him to remain out of jail on bond while it was heard. Former Governor Aycock made an impassioned speech before the North Carolina Supreme Court, but in the end the court upheld the verdict and sentence. Joshua was staying in a hotel in Norfolk, Virginia, and police officers were dispatched there to take him into custody. When the officers knocked on the door of Joshua's room, he slammed the door in their face. Seconds later, they heard a gunshot. Joshua was found lying on the bed, a pistol by his side and a bullet hole in his forehead. He had finished a suicide note, still protesting his innocence, but saying he was an old man and couldn't face the prospect of spending his last years in prison. Kenneth was never found and so mystery remained as deep, dark and shadowy as the Maple Swamp and the Blackwater Creeks of Currituck County. Was Joshua really such a sadistic character that he would murder an eight-year-old child in revenge for a local liquor ordinance? Had North Carolina politics really sunk to that level? Did Joshua's daughter, who surprisingly didn't testify at her father's trial, take part in luring her student into the woods to be abducted? Or did someone else steal the child away? Or in a truly horrible miscarriage of justice for everyone, did the boy simply get lost in the woods, wander away and die from the cold, never to be discovered? I would like to say a huge thank you to Charles Oldham for providing this information for us to share today. In his book, The Senator's Son, he provides the first thoroughly researched account of this fascinating story. It covers all the angles, from the newspaper accounts to the trial records to the deed books, as well as a scientific analysis of the scene of the disappearance. He puts forth a plausible theory for what happened and comes as close as anyone can to the final answer. The book is published by Beach Glass Books and I've included the relevant links below if you would like to purchase a copy for yourself. It's available in hard paper versions or electronically. As always, I would really like to hear your thoughts and feedback on this case. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. The Outer Banks of North Carolina are famous for wild horses that live on some of the beaches. Goodbye.